So good morning everybody. My topic today uh, is the technology of wall paintings. I'll begin straight away with a very important uh, idea which is uh, the fact that uh, wall paintings are an integral part of architecture. I'll show you a, an image of a Byzantine church San Peter at Otranto in uh, Apulia in southern Italy. It is dated to the 10th and 11th, uh, between the 10th and 11th century AD. Uh, different parts have been uh, done uh, at different periods. Um, the, the important point is that uh, frescoes and architecture belong together. Uh, this church has been planned to be painted from the beginning and the paintings have been adapted to the shape of this architecture. So uh, they must uh, be studied as an ensemble. The analysis of paintings can give and al almost always gives um, additional information on the monument. To do this, it is very important to use uh, the, uh, the right technical terms. Beginning with the support, what is the support? Uh, well, it is the structure which carries the painting. It can be a brick wall, as in the case of uh, Russian Byzantine uh, churches. It can be a raw cut uh, rock. Um, or uh, a cave, even a cave, it can be a stone wall, for example, or uh, mixed uh, structures, as many examples in Italy show. Then we have uh, the substrate, which mostly has two layers, two kinds of layers. One um, is the arricho, which is the mortar, it is the mortar uh, which can have various kinds of um, structures and also aggregates, materials. And then uh, we have the intonaco, which uh, is the final layer of uh, slaked lime. In some cases, there is a thin third layer that can be uh, fine slaked lime, uh, gypsum or clay. However, real frescoes have to be painted on slaked lime. If they are not painted on slaked lime, they are not frescoes. So we are talking in that case on a secco painting. A lot of these terms are Italian words like arriccio, intonaco, a secco, a fresco, and so on. Most probably because uh, the first uh, studies on this uh, topic have been carried out in Italy uh, because there are so many frescoes, of course. If we have a very rough uh, support like this one, uh, we have, um, for example, here there are uh, pieces of uh, rocks, and, uh, but also pieces of bricks. Um, so we have brick fragments and stone. Uh, a lower layer is also necessary just to level up the surface under the arricho. Um, so we have uh, a, this very rough kind of layer, which is called rinzaffo in Italian. Uh, this term is not uh, very uh, commonly used, so I'm just uh, uh, mentioning it, but I won't use it in later, uh, showing later slides. In this case, um, we have slaked lime mixed uh, with a rather coarse uh, sand and uh, pozzolana fragments, which have been uh, mixed all together. Normally, in uh, Byzantine Russia, this was not necessary uh, because uh, the wall, the support, uh, was made of bricks, so it was uh, uh, level enough. What is pozzolana? Pozzol I just mentioned pozzolana as a mixture in this Malta. Uh, pozzolana is a volcanic stone 
which um, in Italy is found in uh, Lazio and in Campania, and it was widely employed in Roman times, mainly because of uh, its uh, properties uh, as uh, hydraulic uh, for hydraulic Malta. Vitruvius Pollio, uh, who wrote uh, De Architectura, mentions Pozzolana as uh, the right material for hydraulic Malta, but of course Pozzolana also have properties, uh, these hydraulic properties, which are very useful also in the intonaco of frescoes. Pozzolana type materials are of course not only found in southern Italy but in various other places as well. For example, uh, we know that uh, in antiquity um, there were uh, people collecting Pozzolana at Santorini in Greece. Uh, there is plenty of Pozzolana uh, in Germany as well. In Romania, particularly at Iasi, uh, but we also have uh, Pozzolana in Crimea uh, on the Mount Karadag and in the northern Caucasus at Nalcic. So we have to look out for this as well. About the substrates, already in the Bronze Age there were different kinds of substrates, not only uh, slaked lime, which uh, I have mentioned just before, but also gypsum, for example. In the same period, in exactly the same period in the Bronze Age, gypsum was used in Egypt and uh, in, uh, in Crete, for example, there was already real fresco. As I mentioned, if the sub, uh, substrate, if uh, it is not um, uh, slaked lime, we cannot talk about fresco, it is a, a painting a secco. The arriccio normally consists of slaked lime uh, mixed uh, with different materials, but normally it is sand, uh, quartz sand, crushed bricks and so on. In general, it was prepared with coarser sand than the one which was used for the intonaco, because sand was also mixed in, in the intonaco, but it was much finer. What I'm showing you here uh, are the kinds of uh, sands which uh, are used in modern fresco painting. But of course, there are many more possibilities, many more possible additions bo to both the Arriccio and also uh, the, the Intonaco. Uh, it is quite important to uh, mention also that uh, the Intonaco and the Arriccio had to be prepared, uh, prepared in some way, and so um, we often find uh, this kind of uh, incisions in the Arriccio. You can, you can see that this uh, herringbone pattern here in the house of uh, Orpheus at Paphos in Cyprus. So this was done to, uh, just to hold better the, uh, the layer of intonaco which was put on it afterwards. To study uh, the composition of the substrate of the arriccio, uh, we have to use a destructive method. We use uh, thin sections. So a small sample has to be taken from the wall and has to be polished, mounted in resins to be looked at at the, at the microscope. This is a, an example of Malta uh, from uh, the Roman Terme at Fiesole, uh, dated to the 1st century AD, AD. This is a study by Frattini of the um, Centro Nazionale di Ricerca uh, in Rome. The samples uh, which we need to do uh, thin sections are very small, so 3 millimeters can be enough to do this it can be enough for our kind of studies, so uh, it is not uh, that we take big chunks of uh, the, uh, the mortar from the wall. 
what we know in general about uh, the aricho used in antiquity is that um, the materials which uh, were used for uh, the Malta in this case were local materials. So, so all these aricho uh, we have studied or we can study are very different from each other. You can see a few examples here. Uh, you see, for example, the, the, these um, um, sample from Pompeii, which contains fragments of volcanic rocks. If you look at the other one, um, which I'm showing you on this slide, uh, it is a sample from Fiesule in Tuscany, and they used cocho pesto, which means they used uh, baked clay fragments. Uh, bricks and so on. So you see the structure of these mortars is very, very different. In this case, uh, this is an example from Mutina, which is uh, Modena uh, nowadays. In mod uh, the modern name is Modena, and it is a late Roman fresco uh, support. In this case, uh, the lime preparation was mixed with recycled Malta fragments, because uh, this is an excellent material to uh, render the arricho, so the subst substrate, more uh, usual to uh, to have a better uh, to have a better uh, uh, property uh, than uh, simple uh, Malta. Let's talk about uh, the upper layer, the intonaco. As I said before, uh, it normally has two layers, uh, two or more layers actually, there can be more than, than two, as we uh, will probably see on some of the samples. Uh, this thin section clearly shows the Arricho layer here. This is the Arricho uh, and it contains larger pieces of uh, larger, larger inclusions. Uh, while uh, the layer of intonaco, which is the grey one you see here, contains less uh, inclusions and they are smaller as well. What I wa also want to point out is this very thin layer which you see here uh, on the side and uh, this is a layer of the so-called um, lime milk. It is also slaked lime and it was used as a, as a very last uh, finishing layer. Um, lime milk was also used as white color uh, for paintings on, on, on the pigments directly, uh, but it could also be mixed uh, with other pigments to achieve different colors. So uh, what you see here is a picture I took at uh, Herculanum, uh, one of the towns around uh, Vesuvius, which was destro destroyed at the time of the eruption, which destroyed Pompeii as well. Uh, in many cases, as I said, uh, the pigments on the backgrounds are painted uh, with the fresco technique, but um, in, uh, the, in, in other cases, I'm sorry, uh, the details were pigments mixed uh, with lime milk added on the already dried fresco. So in this case, um, we have a, an Aseco technique, uh, which sometimes is also called uh, half fresco. However, I don't think that it is a good idea to call it like this. It is lime milk painting. It's a much better um, name for it and it also says what it really is. Um, what I'm showing you here is the general formula for frescoes. So we have a slate lime, which is a calcium hydroxide uh, which um, under the action of carbon dioxide in the air, it uh, dries up, uh, it evaporates the calcium and, and it transforms, uh, it turns to calcium carbonate, while the water 
which was originally in the slate lime evaporates. This is very, very important to understand because um, normally people think that the pigments were absorbed by uh, the intonaco, by the substrate, but it is not so. It is the intonaco which uh, turns to um, calcium carbonate and it uh, englobes the pigment. So what is slaked lime? Slaked lime um, is won by using uh, quicklime. Quicklime is caustic and is produced by burning uh, limestones or marble. It was done very often in antiquity and also later. Many, many uh, ancient statues made of marble have been destroyed because uh, people use them to obtain quicklime. Uh, and yes, there are also other kinds of stones which contain calcium carbonate which, and can be used for uh, the production of quicklime. Um, the stones are burnt at a temperature of uh, 950 to uh, 980 degrees. In, during this pro uh, process, carbon dioxide is freed and leaves back our quicklime. Quicklime uh, with, uh, uh, will be mixed with water afterwards and it becomes uh, slaked lime, which was used for uh, the intonaco. This kind of preparation is very low, uh, slow and it takes really a couple of months. It, uh, the material needs to rest for a couple of months. Um, so the surface is what, uh, what hardens first, of course, and to avoid incomplete crystallization, the intonaco must be applied in different layers. That's why we find different layers under our pigments. The slaked lime that had to be used for frescoes had to rest, as I said, for at least six months, which is a long period of time you have to uh, prepare your slaked lime uh, to obtain a complete hydration of uh, the material. In Roman times, uh, the slate lime was left in very big um, tubs, large tubs, uh, for three years, as we uh, know from uh, the writings of uh, Pliny, for example, and also Vitruvius. As I said, in Roman times, Pozzolana was uh, one of the additions, uh, and Pozzolana is uh, a natural stone which contains silica which, uh, and, and in presence of water, forms cementing compounds. And the crystalline structure locks in the pigments. The quality of water is also important. The quantity of, of water is even more important. Uh, it was important to add the right quantity of water in the various phases of the preparation of slate lime uh, because um, the slate lime uh, had to be mixed with very clean water without any organic substances. What happens if the intonaco is mixed with too much water? In that case, when it is applied on the wall, it becomes porous and it is not resistant enough because um, the uh, excess water produces voids in the structure of the intonaco and uh, forms a thicker crust on the surface. And of course, this is not good for uh, frescoes in general or for the intonaco as well because it breaks easily. 
What we see here is the mechanism in detail. I did this uh, quite simple drawing. Um, we have um, the uh, this uh, on the on the side is the support. Then we have the Arricio layer with bigger uh, inclusions, larger stones inclusions, larger sand, for example, as well. Then we have uh, the Intonaco with finer. Uh, much finer sand and the layer of uh, intonacino which is the second the final layer of intonaco which we normally find on the surface and this is the one which um, also englobes the pigments however we can also have a rougher kind of intonaco which englobes the pigment this is one example I am making when the um, calcium carbonate uh, from the intonaco migrates to the surface uh, together with the water, uh, while the water is evaporating, it, it also takes some time, um, it turns to um, carbonate and englobes uh, the pigments, as I said before. This is very important. It is a very important uh, uh, point and it has to be remembered uh, when working on frescoes in general. So it is the pigments which are locked in and not, um, the, not absorbed by the intonaco layer underneath. The pigments remain on top. So I mentioned the intonacino, which is the fine, uh, final layer on top of the intonaco. Uh, and it is often a mixture of slaked lime with very, very fine sand. And quite often, in Roman times at least, uh, it is mixed with marble powder. However, there can be many variations. What you see uh, at the top here is a fragment of Roman uh, intonaco. Uh, the top layer you see is the pigment, of course, and then you see a pink layer, which is the intonacino. This one is mixed uh, with sand and it, it is also colored. We often find uh, colored uh, intonacini. Uh, they can be yellow, pink and so on but we also uh, can have uh, many different variations. This is a sample from Novgorod and you can see uh, some red uh, color under the layer, the thin layer of intonacino here. This is the pigment on top. So we are going to uh, discuss uh, this uh, further. So, as I said, in many cases, the intonacino is colored and there is a, also a colored layer between the pigment and the uh, intonacino. What you see here is another uh, example from Novgorod, from the uh, St. George uh, Cathedral. You see the blue pigment on top, then you see a red layer underneath, and this is the intonacino layer, which goes uh, down to here. And then we have the intonaco with more inclusions, more sand. Um, we don't know exactly uh, why in antiquity this red layer was used. There are several uh, hypotheses. One, um, the, it certainly had a technical function the most logical one would be um, that it was changing uh, the color of the pigment which was put on top of it. However, uh, this layer might also have had a technical function. Uh, one of the uh, proposals, one of the hypotheses says that uh, it was a protection from humidity. And this might uh, have some truth in it. Uh, what I believe more than a protection from humidity is that uh, it, ha it uh, worked as a protection from efflorescences of uh, or salts or um, 
to modify the color as well. How did they work? How did ancient uh, painters work on the wall? They used, uh, and this is again an Italian term, uh, pontate. What does it mean? It means that uh, they, were, they were using scaffoldings to uh, reach the upper uh, part of the fresco, of course, and so they uh, worked on one day on a pontata. So the intonaco uh, was applied in uh, large uh, bands uh, and it had the height of a man, uh, about the height of a man, so that it was easy to work in one day on this uh, period before the intonaco dried up, of course. So you see also the structure of the Roman paintings uh, is also due to the pontate, to this way of working uh, the frescoes. This is another example, the Casa di Giulio Polibio at Pompeii, and also here you see uh, the pontate, the different uh, layers of um, intonaco. What about uh, Byzantine techniques? Well, they uh, derive directly from the Roman techniques, However, there are um, different, um, some differences. differences. One of them is uh, that uh, the substrates, the ariccio and the intonaco, are normally thicker than the ones we find in Roman frescoes. Why is that? Because uh, of the support. Uh, the churches, the Byzantine churches, are normally made of uh, bricks. So uh, the substrate has to be thicker because of the humidity. So the proportions of the frescoes in Byzantine art uh, were defined in advance. There were also preparatory drawings on top of the intonaco. Uh, if we are lucky, we can found, find some traces of it. Um, the paint was uh, first applied on the background and on large areas uh, and there was also more color contrast than uh, in the Roman in Roman art I would say. The last uh, details like lines, uh, highlights and so on, uh, different shades were used uh, were uh, usually added at the end of this uh, process. Um, compared to Roman intonaco, the Byzantine intonaco contains less sand, but uh, many more organic materials. Uh, we have uh, straw additions, uh, chaff, husks, all sorts of uh, vegetable uh, materials, but also, yes, hemp, of course, also ha uh, animal hair. As I said, the thickness of the intonaco, uh, the major thickness of intonaco in Byzantine times, is due to the use of brick walls for the churches. Um, Necta and Denis de Forna describe this mixture of lime uh, with straw in the ariccio, and they say uh, that um, for the finer uh, layer of the intonaco, lime and oakum uh, of linen was used. So we, uh, we can find different kinds of preparation layers. The outlines of the figures had to be polished before the paint application. So we can find in the intonaco also the traces of polishing. As we all know, in uh, Byzantine art, the, we have uh, hieratic figures, rather flat. We have uh, mainly frontal views and no foot line. Uh, it is quite interesting to note that at first the halos of the saints uh, were drawn with a compass and then uh, the drawings of the heads was done afterwards. The iconography, as we know, was strictly uh, determined 
for the, for each saint more or less and they also used uh, rectangular areas like Pontate, which are uh, very visible uh, on frescoes in Serbia, Cyprus and Moldavia. This is an example from Serbia. You can see uh, the Pontate from the church of uh, Morasa near Studenica in Serbia. It is dated to the 13th century um, AD. So Pontate have been used uh, later as well. Now uh, we talk about pigments. Which kind of pigments were used in antiquity and also in the Middle Ages, of course. We have, uh, of course, mineral pigments, which uh, consist mainly of oxides, carbonates, sulfides and sulfates. Normally of uh, metallic minerals, actually. Then we have artificial uh, mineral pigments, for example, uh, Egyptian blue, and we are going to talk about this uh, later as well, and uh, artificial uh, cinnabar. We will discuss cinnabar as well. We also have organic pigments, which can be animal pigments or vegetable pigments, like um, uh, animal pigments can be the ones worn from cochineal, for example, and vegetable pigments can be can come from um, various other kinds of uh, plants like mother uh, and so on. Uh, animal uh, pigments is also purple, of course, which was a very um, expensive pigment in antiquity. Of course, we also have mixed pigments, which are the more difficult task for us, uh, for people who are studying the, fragment, the pigments uh, and the frescoes. In the ideal case, uh, pigments for fresco paintings should be stable. So they, that means that they should be resistant to water, humidity, uh, to the air, to the sun as well, to the light, and so on. The pigments should also be free of acidic components, which can come from uh, the pigment itself, or from organic uh, additions, or even from the water. If the, the water is acidic, it is not a good idea for, to have it for uh, frescoes. In reality, uh, a lot of unstable pigments were used for frescoes as well. Uh, it, we have different examples in different times and in different places, so we cannot uh, point out a specific place for this and a, a specific period. I have to point out that there are uh, analyses, quite a lot of analyses uh, for, uh, of Roman uh, frescoes, but um, a few of them are properly made and we don't know that much, not even on Roman frescoes. We know even less on Byzantine frescoes. For example, we don't know exactly how uh, uh, the Roman fresco, a secco um, painting on top of the fresco was added. We don't know exactly, uh, in many cases, which kind of mixtures were added. And we also don't know uh, an important point, and it is how the surface was polished. You see here an example, uh, photo I took at uh, Herculaneum and you can see, easily see, how polished it was. It really reflects the light. So which are uh, stable natural mineral pigments? We have of course lime and we also have kaolin, which is the fine, uh, finer uh, kind of uh, intonaco uh, ingredient. We have okra, 
Siena and Caput Mortum, which are just three different names for uh, a very similar kind of mixture with more or less uh, elements uh, one or the other, but they are very, very similar. Uh, just the color changes, and we are discussing the color afterwards. Um, then we have uh, Green Earth, which um, is normally a mixture of Celadonite and Gloconite, and we have Malachite as green pigments. Then we have uh, Lapis Lazuli, the blue pigment, which is, uh, consists of uh, Lazurite, and it is also called uh, Oltremare in, um, in history of art. And then we have Umbra, which is also a, a pigment which is very similar to um, ochre. So these were the stable pigments. Now we discuss the unstable mineral pigments, which are, uh, for example, lead white, uh, which uh, with uh, humidity um, and also with light turns to brown. Uh, we don't want to have uh, uh, brown instead of white, of course, so they had to do some treatment of the surface. The same uh, happens with Minium, which is um, a very uh, red, uh, orangey red color, and it also turns to brown uh, in contact with humidity or light and so on. Also Azurite, which is copper carbonate, um, in contact with humidity, humidity loses its blue color, it is a very beautiful blue color, but it turns green to, uh, with, with humidity, it turns to malachite. And if there is a sulfur in the air, as we have nowadays uh, with the cars, but also in antiquity, uh, for example, with uh, um, resinous uh, torches or uh, heating, uh, with raisins or even with olive oil, the lamps uh, which uh, contained olive oil, um, the azurite can turn to black, so it becomes really black. Uh, in antiquity also verdigris uh, was used as a green pigment, uh, it is a copper acetate and with humidity it also alters and it becomes whitish to pinkish. It's a very strange color which you don't want on your green on the frescoes. Finally we have cinnabar. Cinnabar is very sensitive to light, particularly the sunlight and also to humidity and turns again to black on the frescoes. So it had to be treated uh, in different ways to, be, uh, to become stable. White mineral pigments, what do we have? Let's talk about uh, colors now. The most common white uh, for frescoes is lime. It is used for the uh, aricho, for the intonacos, so for the substrates, and it is also used as a pigment, as I said just before, uh, for uh, and also for the lime painting on top, a secco. Uh, we have different kinds of calcium carbonate uh, which uh, can be distinguished. It could be uh, powdered marble as well. We have gypsum uh, which was also used as a white uh, pigment on frescoes. We have uh, kaolinite, it is based on uh, kaolin uh, which contains aluminium and um, silicium, and it was uh, sometimes mixed uh, with, uh, with the intonaco as well. And then uh, we have a seriocyte, which is um, a lead carbonate, which has the problem that it turns black uh, with light and humidity. It happens with quite a few uh, mineral-based um, uh, uh, pigments. For black, normally 
charcoal, uh, carbon was used. So we, uh, we find uh, even pieces, uh, fragments, tiny fragments of wood charcoal inside the pigment sometimes. Um, very often uh, they also used a lamp black, soot from the lamps which is a very nice uh, deep black uh, color and could be mixed uh, with lime, for example. Then there is um, ivory black, uh, so they burnt ivory to obtain a, a very precious uh, black pigment, which was uh, used in rich uh, houses, in, in Roman houses. We also have uh, bone black, which uh, was used uh, more widely, of course, it is cheaper than ivory black. And then we have wine black, which is a very uh, interesting kind of uh, black, because it also has a slight blue nuance. Um, wine black is obtained by burning um, grape uh, plants. So you burn them and you obtain this uh, special kind of pigment. Finally, for black, various mixtures of uh, calcium carbonate of lime uh, were used uh, mixed with uh, manganese and iron salts and clay. Apparently, these uh, kind of um, black pigments were uh, widely used in Cyprus. I'm showing you an example from Cyprus here. Um, this is uh, the measurement which um, shows uh, the manganese and iron content of this uh, pigment, these black pigments, which has been used to paint a wreath on a black, uh, sorry, on a white uh, background. You see here um, the, the appearance of the pigment on the surface. So this is a manganese and iron, a manganese and iron, and, and iron mixture with lime. Which kind of yellow pigments do we have? We have uh, the most common one is, is uh, yellow ochre, which is uh, one from uh, the mineral limonite. It is a, an iron um, mineral, of course. It is found in the mines, in iron mines as well. Then we have another yellow pigment which is found in, uh, quite often in mines and it is opiment which is a, a, an arsenic sulfide. So it is of course poisonous. But it has a very uh, bright orangey yellow color which was much appreciated in antiquity. And then we have a massicot the so-called massicot, which is a lead oxide, uh, which was also has been also used on frescoes. However, also uh, this kind of uh, pigment has some problems because it is not very stable and it turns to black as well. Let's talk uh, for a moment about yellow ochre which uh, has been used since prehistory. It is a, a very common kind of mineral. And as I said, it is very stable. If you use it on uh, paintings, uh, it stays, um, it keeps the color and uh, doesn't change at all. So if you use the yellow one, it stays yellow. If you use the red one, it stays uh, red, brown, or whatever uh, dark brown you have. However, a yellow ochre becomes red when it is heated. So, uh, as the last studies at Pompeii have shown, it is possible that what we understand under Pompeii red was actually a yellow color and it became red on only because of the eruption of the Vesuvius. So, this example uh, of fresco from Pompeii was most probably yellow because uh, you can see 
you can see still some uh, yellow remains on the on the wall and uh, it became red only during the eruption so we have to be careful about this for example if there was a fire in uh, in in the house where the frescoes are Yes, uh, this is um, arsenic sulfide, or uh, piment, seen at the microscope. It is found in volcanic areas and in uh, mines, as I said. The color can go from very bright lemon to uh, almost orange. And uh, the problem is that it turns black in contact with uh, copper-based pigments like malachite, and azurite, for example, but also Egyptian blue. Uh, if it comes in contact with lead uh, pigments like uh, cerusite, the white pigment, or massicot, the yellow one uh, I mentioned before, and also uh, tin, lead and tin uh, pigments, uh, which can be white or yellow. About red pigments, we have already mentioned red ochre, which is the most uh, common one. Uh, it uh, consists of hematite, and it is also called uh, in ancient uh, texts bolo or sinopia. It is a, an iron oxide. Uh, other um, red pigments are cinnabar, Cinnabar, which is uh, mercury sulfide, and it, it has a, a very bright uh, red, red, a very beautiful red. Uh, and minium, which is a lead oxide. We are going to see some examples just now. Yes, about Sinopia. Sinopia is made of red ochre, and it was also used um, widely, very widely used from Roman times until the Renaissance um, and of course in the Middle Ages for the preliminary drawings on the intonaco. Uh, you, it was also used as a pigment for other things as well, of course, but uh, for us it is important that it was used for the preliminary drawings on the intonaco. And as I said, it is found from very early times until uh, the 20th century. This is an example I'm showing you. It is the, the uh, Pantocrato, uh, the painting is the Pantocrato in the mandola, uh, in the apsis of the church of the Nunziatella at Nunziata, the village is called Nunziata, and it is near Catania in Sicily. This one is dated to the 12th century, and you can see that Sinopia, in this case, was used also to underline the figure, uh, for example, the, the external lines, and also the shades on, on the body and the face. So this is Sinopia. Sinopia has also been found under mosaics too. It has been used as, uh, for the preparatory drawings for uh, mosaics as well. Uh, you see it here. Uh, this is the Basilica of San Lorenzo in Milan, uh, which is dated to the 4th century uh, AD. Let's turn to uh, Cinema, uh, which regrettably turns black uh, when uh, it is in the light and uh, humidity. Even Pliny, in his um, encyclopedia, the uh, Naturalis Historia, the Natural History, he wrote in um, 35 books. In, the, in book 33, he is discussing uh, pigments as well. And he, he says that um, cinnabar had to be treated with wax as a protection uh, against the light, particularly the light of the sun. So even in antiquity they were aware of this uh, uh, problem with cinnabar. And the sample I'm showing you here, the example, uh, is from a villa at Castellamare di Stabia, one of the um, cities, Roman cities, which were destroyed 
uh, by the uh, Vesuvius. So this is the color of minium. You can see it is a very beautiful orange red, uh, which was widely used in antiquity. And also this one blackens by strong light and it had to be um, protected somehow. They used several uh, materials, uh, not only wax, to protect this uh, pigment. It is very highly covering, so it, uh, it only needs um, one layer of color. So it was also um, very much liked by, by people because of the color, but on, also because of this property. And it also uh, has a very glossy effect. It, it is shiny. It's a very nice pigment to be used for frescoes. What about green pigments? We already mentioned uh, green earth, which has this uh, rather complex um, composition. Uh, we have malachite, uh, copper carbonate. We have Egyptian green, which is an artificial pigment. And we have various mixtures of yellow and blue. Uh, the example I'm showing you here is a painting representing the goddess Flora and it, it is from a villa at Castellamare di Stabia, Stabia, the town which was destroyed. I like it particularly because for this beautiful painting only three colors have been used, only uh, green earth, uh, ochre and lime, nothing else. But as you can see, it looks like uh, polychromy. Green earth, as I said, uh, is normally powdered gloconite and celadonite. Uh, sometimes we have more uh, gloconite, sometimes we have more uh, celadonite. We have to find out about this uh, with analysis. It is a very common pigment. It is very stable. Uh, sometimes, uh, to uh, achieve different colors, different nuances, it was mixed uh, with Egyptian blue, or with, with different kinds of yellow, um, with organic black, and so, by, and, so, uh, and so on. Celadonite and gloconite, uh, green earth, were also used for skin colors and for shading particularly in Byzantine times. It is a Byzantine invention, actually, this shading with green. You see an example here from Castel Seprio in Lombardia in Italy, uh, which is dated to the 9th, uh, 10th century uh, AD, and another one here uh, uh, from Lambach, the church at Lambach in Austria. You see uh, that the faces, the shades, on the faces are painted with green. It is a Byzantine uh, habit, a Byzantine um, tradition, actually. And what you see here is a very beautiful fragment from Novgorod, uh, from the church at uh, Gorodice. And you see uh, it is an excellent example of shading with green. We will see uh, which kind of green it was. Uh, maybe it was mixed, most probably uh, there are more pigments uh, involved in this uh, painting. And from this technique comes the use of green earth, which was used also in later times for the human uh, features. Like uh, in this case, uh, just to show you one example, this is a Madonna by Duccio di Boninsegna, dated um, to the 13th century, and you can see that the face was um, painted uh, with uh, a green layer under the color of the flesh. Malachite. Malachite uh, is also uh, widely used in antiquity. It is uh, more expensive than uh, green earth, of course, uh, there are not that many places where you can find malachite. Normally it is in copper mines. Um, malachite is um, stable, but less stable than green earth. And um, 
it is less used because um, it is more expensive. However, the color of malachite is quite striking. You see this example here, which is from the church at uh, Mustair in Switzerland. It's very close to the border to where I live, actually. Uh, this church is dated to the 9th century AD. You can see uh, the, the shades of green which have been used in this church as well. Uh, this is a later example, of course. This is uh, a painting by Spinello Aretino, um, dated to uh, 1380, and it is in the church of Santa Trinita at Florence. You see the typical green of malachite here, used uh, mixed with the yellow colors, of course. What about blue pigments? Uh, one uh, common pigment is azurite. I have already mentioned it. Then we have lapis lazuli, Egyptian blue, and calcium blue, uh, lime, and uh, mixtures, various mixtures with copper normally. Um, it is lime. Calcium blue is normally lime mixed with, uh, for example, copper carbonate, azurite, or uh, a bit of um, uh, lapis lazuli or something like this, uh, very seldom, uh, because um, uh, calcium blue was used in later times mainly. Uh, we also have uh, Egyptian blue. However, uh, calcium blue was also obtained by using black uh, black pigments, organic black pigments, carbon, and in particular wine black, which I have mentioned before. So we, what you see here is a, a light blue wall at Herculaneum. Uh, yes, azurite, uh, as I said, uh, it is uh, unstable, it is an unstable pigment, it turns to malachite in presen presence of uh, humidity, water, However, uh, it uh, stayed uh, stable, luckily, in the Cappella degli Scrovegni, which you see here in Padova, the paintings of Giotto. Uh, however, it can also become black, as I said, when sulfur is present in the, in the air, in the atmosphere. Lapis lazuli was certainly uh, the most precious uh, pigment used in antiquity and later um, because it was uh, produced by uh, grinding uh, lapis lazuli, a precious stone. So, of course, it was very precious. And also there are not many place, places where uh, we can find um, lapis lazuli. The main um, uh, deposit of lapis lazuli, the largest one, is in Badakhshan in Afghanistan and it has been um, exploited since antiquity but there are also other places where lazurite can be found, for example uh, near Lake Baikal. This is a sample from Novgorod, from the um, Church of uh, St. Uh, George it has been widely used in this church. Uh, the color becomes uh, lighter uh, when it is mixed uh, with lime. And it was uh, seldom employed on early frescoes because of the, uh, of the um, expenses, of course. And mostly it is found in Roman times, for example, uh, mixed uh, with azurite to to limit the expenses, of course. What was Egyptian blue? Egyptian blue was made uh, by heating a mixture of calcium carbonate and uh, some copper compound, like, for example, malachite, but also it could be um, copper, real copper, or brass, or bronze, even bronze, um, mixed uh, with uh, the calcium carbonate, with silica sand, soda or potash, and to be used as a flux, 
to render the um, uh, composition uh, more uh, liquid during uh, the process. And um, the, uh, the pigment which was obtained was uh, blue. It uh, could also be green in some cases, but uh, when the mixture is uh, changed a bit. The example I'm showing you, um, it has been analyzed um, and it was uh, identified in all the blue colors of the paintings or frescoes of this church. This is the church of San Saba in Rome, dated to the 8th century uh, AD, of course. There are also several evidences that uh, Egyptian blue has been also used during the Renaissance, but it is not clear if uh, the Renaissance painters were using freshly made Egyptian blue or if they were using Egyptian blue scratched from Roman uh, frescoes because this is what happened as well. Some people scratched down the um, Roman frescoes to obtain the pigments. So uh, these uh, Renaissance cases of use of uh, Egyptian blue might be due to this uh, really bad habit of destroying frescoes to get the pigments. We have an example here of Egyptian blue and green. Uh, this is uh, the church of uh, Pantalaimon at Neresi in Macedonia. Macedonia. Uh, it is dated to the second half of the 12th century and they employed both Egyptian blue here, for example for the background and uh, the clothes here, and um, Egyptian green for the cuirass here, for the uh, clothes uh, here, and also for the background, for the, for, the board, um, for the floor. So it was widely used uh, even in, um, uh, in the mid Middle Ages. Which kind of um, methods do we use to identify the pigments? Well, uh, the first examination is done with an optical microscope. Of course, um, we had to see uh, the texture, the structure of the pigments, and we have to examine, if possible, uh, the intonaco as well. However, uh, as a second step, we can use um, X-ray fluorescence. It is one a good way for, uh, to get a first screening of the pigments to see um, which kind of pigments were used, uh, to have a, a good idea of which kind of pigments were used. However, of course, the perfect tool uh, for um, the analysis of fresco fragments is the scanning electron microscope, which you see here, that shows layers and structures and uh, allows also the micro analysis of tiny, tiny details of all layers and so on. We can also use, uh, we also use uh, X-ray diffraction, which is a method which does not give simply the elements which are present in the pigment, uh, but it also tells us which kind of salts, which kind of minerals, compounds uh, were used uh, for the pigment. So it's a very use useful um, uh, method as well. About mixtures, we have a lot of mixtures. Uh, what I'm showing you now are a few examples of um, from Paphos. Um, you see uh, Roman frescoes from Paphos uh, with uh, pigment mixtures. This white pigment uh, is uh, white calcite mixed with Egyptian blue. So you, you see the tiny, tiny spots, but you see them at the microscope. You don't see them just like this. They really wanted to give to this uh, white pigment some kind of uh, bluish nuance as well. 
then um, you see here the blue um, Egyptian blue mixed uh, with iron oxide I, I, I have taken Egyptian blue I could have taken a different color um, because we have a lot of mixtures but uh, I think it's a, it is a good example so we have um, uh, Egyptian blue mixed with hematite in this case here then we have um, blue color uh, the blue color of um, Egyptian blue mixed with okra with yellow okra so uh, that uh, they achieved a greenish color and then with carbon black because it makes the carbon black deeper if you mix it with blue as well uh, then we have here a green earth mixed with blue, with iron, um, with iron oxide, with goethite, which is a yellow pigment, and also with manganese. The black spots are manganese, which you see here, the black pigment uh, called, um, uh, particularly used in Paphos. And then we have an example of green earth here mixed again with Egyptian blue so with uh, iron oxide here with yellow and uh, manganese and here with Egyptian blue and this is uh, the painting uh, for which these mixtures have been found uh, have been used this gives you an idea of what we uh, are finding in the different mixtures these are examples from uh, a study by Knutinen, uh, Finnish uh, scholars. Uh, they have been studying pigments at Pompeii. So I'll show you some uh, cross sections, which is something we do as well with our fragments of pigments from Novgorod. Um, this is a paint uh, layer. Uh, the, the, you simply see a paint uh, layer of blue and this is the intonaco underneath however in this case here we have a separate red pigment here and underneath a blue paint uh, a blue pigment and this gives of course a violet impression the color the final color the color which we see is violet but you see here how it was achieved and here again we have a layer of uh, green earth and a layer of uh, blue uh, which I think it, it was um, Egyptian blue as well and we have a, a turquoise color in this case so uh, now you know almost everything we have to do uh, at uh, the St. George Cathedral at Novgorod these are some of the beautiful fragments from this church and uh, I think more will be said in another lecture. Thank you very much for your attention.